there's a limit on how high you can set your recording levels, right? If you hit them too hard, you'll get that distortion, right? However, setting your levels way down here so that you're safe from that stuff is not a good move here as we just saw in that video. In any signal chain, you have a certain amount of noise down here from your mic preamp uh, cables and interference and from lighting and so on. Could be basically anything. Your, jewel, uh, Rob, your job from rule number one is to get a clean signal. But imagine that noise floor is down here. If you set your levels down here, you're gonna have to pull that up and guess what else comes up there too. If you're too afraid of distortion, putting it down here might not be a good move because you'll bring, when you boost it up, you'll bring all that noise uh, up as well. Um, we're not only boosting the good signal, we're boosting that bad signal there. So the solution is to record your signal as, as hot as possible without uh, actually distorting. Just go ahead and make some test recordings. Watch your meters and listen with headphones. Now, one note I'd like to make in this section is understanding how higher bit resolution recorders actually help uh, kind of give you some wiggle room in this, in this area. Many recorders, and in fact the CD standard, are 16-bit. That means the amplitude of the waveform is plotted at any particular point at over 65,000 different levels. If I was to make up something like a 17-bit recorder, that would be twice the resolution of that. It's kind of like the checkerboard that we saw a moment ago, add a bit and it doubles the resolution. Well, if you do the math, then a 24-bit recorder has over 250 times the resolution of a 16-bit recorder. Well, you might say, so what? Well, let's take an analogy that we're all familiar with, and that is uh, digital cameras. Back in the day, the first round of cameras were around one megapixel and they looked fine on a computer screen. But do you remember when you tried to blow them up, right? They got really blocky. There was really no way that you could afford to take a picture like this from way back with your subject far away. You had to get in close. This is like making a recording with your vocal you know, way down here. In both instances, you have to amplify the signal which will bring up the junk factor, we'll just call it the junk factor. But let's imagine you have a brand new 10 megap megapixel camera. You can now afford to capture a picture that has your subject further away because blowing up that picture won't add any junk due to the high resolution of the photo. There's so much information that you can afford kind of not to zoom in on the subject uh, so closely. Same thing with a 24-bit recorder with so much resolution, over 250 times that of a 16-bit one, you can afford to record at a slightly lower recording level because amping it up later won't bring in as much junk as a 16-bit system. I mean, does that make sense? Now, I'm not advocating recording at a really low level or that 16-bit systems are junk. No, not at all. But whatever system you have, make sure that the recording levels are as hot as possible that you can go without clipping. Uh, I'm just saying that you can afford to leave a little bit more breathing room on a 24-bit system than a 16-bit one. I hope that I, I kind of made that clear. In the same way that you don't have to sweat the framing of a subject on a 10 megapixel camera as much as you do on a one megapixel one. Now, rule number three is isolate the sound. Let's follow an example of recording a guitar. Imagine we plug the guitar into an amp and then mic that amp from a distance what are we re actually recording? Yeah, the, the guitar, the amp, and the sound of the room, and the sound of the room will depend on what kind of environment in. It might be, say, a highly reflective room or a dull hall. Whenever you record like this, you're recording all three elements. But what about if we scooched up that mic? Now we've taken the room kind of out of the equation. Not that it's gone, but that relationship has certainly changed. We are hearing mainly all amp and no room. And finally, we could just record the, the guitar directly on the track for this sound. Now, here's the question. Which of these three scenarios gives us the most flexibility later? The last example, absolutely. We can add the sound of an amp to a dry guitar. You bet. We can do that with a plug-in or a built-in effect. Heck, we could even take the line out of the recorder, plug it into an amp, and then record that back onto another track, right? But what about the sound of the room? I mean, we could do that. It's very easy to drop a reverb onto a track and place it in any environment uh, that you want. In the scenario of recording the guitar through an amp with the mic uh, from a distance, 
I have seen no knob on a console that is labeled take off reverb, right? Or take off distortion. If you want maximum flexibility, think hard about what you are actually recording right there. Now, an exception to this might be when uh, the marriage of two elements are almost like a sound unto themselves. An example I can think of is like a Hammond organ and a Leslie cabinet. We kind of think of them together. Or a 335 guitar with a hot rod deluxe. You know what I mean? If the sound you want is a marriage of two different sounds, then you know I don't mind recording them together because they'll always kind of live together. Now, think about this question when you record your vocals along these lines of isolation. What do you want to record? If you're more than a foot away from your vocal mic, you're not only just capturing your vocal, but you're capturing the sound of the room as well. In that same vein of the guitar example a moment ago, you probably want to isolate your sound as much as possible so you'll have more flexibility later on. Remember, it's always easy to add something to a sound uh, versus taking something out. Now, here's another tip in terms of isolating vocals. Do you remember that we said that the fundamental frequencies of vocals don't go below 80 hertz, about 80 hertz, unless you're Barry White? <laughs> but there's, there's basically nothing down there in terms of vocals. Now imagine there's some low-end rumble of the air conditioner or some distant street noise making its way into that microphone. Why would you record any frequencies below 80 hertz if your vocal is not down there? It's no coincidence that on many mics, and also mixes, you'll see a low frequency roll off at about 80 hertz. Activate that switch and it'll cut out all those frequencies below 80 hertz and just ditch them. Now you might not think this is a big deal, but imagine if you record a lead vocal and then double that and then three doubled harmonies. That's eight tracks of vocals where the low frequency rumble of your air conditioner or street noise just builds up and builds up and robs that part of the frequency spectrum that should only be reserved for your kick drum and bass guitar or synth bass because that's where they live. I mean, does that make sense? I'm always thinking of trimming this stuff out that I don't need so the other tracks can shine through. So let's talk briefly about dynamic range uh, for a second and really how it can, it can bring us a ton of problems. And the, and the question basically is this, how do you capture big dynamics into a finite dynamic range in, uh, of a recorder? We said that before that the human ear is magnificent in terms of its ability to hear both very soft and very loud sounds. Our recording equipment, on the other hand, is a bit more limited. Check out this video.